Hi, welcome to this video on string versus string slices. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley. Unfortunately, when you're teaching Rust to someone new, you have to get over the hurdles of strings, which is a difficult topic to learn in Rust. They are not easy. That may shock existing developers because working with strings in other languages is often extremely easy and feels quite natural. It's no more difficult than dealing with primitives like Booleans or integers. Under the hood though, strings are much more complex in nature no matter the language. The difference comes down to the memory trade-off decision that Rust made that makes Rust a fundamentally different language. Let's explore the ramifications of that briefly. Other languages are able to hide the complexity of strings because of the memory trade-off decisions they've made. That simplified things for the programmer and makes certain things like strings easier, but it sacrifices more complex topics down the road that Rust simply couldn't agree to, and for good reason. Rust makes the developer deal with the complexity of the strings. This, too, comes down to the memory trade-off choice that Rust has made. The benefit will not be apparent to you right off the bat, but it affects runtime speed, concurrency, and much more. In essence, the simple things like strings are harder for developers, but harder topics become much easier down the road. You may get frustrated with strings in Rust at first, but try to keep your zen and know that the memory trade-off for Rust did make strings more difficult, but the benefit at the end of the day will be well worth it. Let's get to some programming. There are two types of strings in Rust. Yes, two. The first type is a string slice defined by str, all lowercase, and we're going to put an ampersand in front of it. It represents a grouping of characters that's immutable for the most part. The second type of string is just called string. It's defined by a capital S and is more like a string from other languages that you might be used to. It's going to be more flexible than the string slice, as we'll see in a moment. Let's talk about some of the similarities and differences. In both cases, it's in essence a grouping of text characters, specifically a grouping of type U8s representing text. The differences are how it's stored in memory and how the programmer handles them. Strings with the capital S are held entirely on the heap. This allows them to be mutable, or in other words, change over time. A string slice is a bit more complex to describe though. It's meant to be immutable. It can be a reference to some heap data or on the stack, or it can be embedded into the compile program itself. It's really much harder to define. Despite the differences, you can easily translate between the two types when necessary. After all, they're just a grouping of U8s, right? So why do we have two different types? Well, the string is great for mutating and holding data longer than the stack is able to. And the string slice is great for runtime speed. It's kind of hard to program text without having either capability. So it'll be important to be able to translate between the two as we please. Back in the code, I created a string slice and a string. I'm using the string from method here to create my new string. There are multiple ways to create strings, and this is one of them. We'll be discussing how to create these soon, but let's first touch upon translating between the two. That's an important topic that you'll need to know how to do. To get a string from a string slice, all we need to do is type dot to string and end it with parentheses. Now you have a more malleable heap allocated form of the string and we can modify it as needed. Hard-coded strings can also be used, but if I try to just assign it, it will produce an error. We can see that all we need to do is put dot to string and we're good to go. It may seem odd to see that even on hard-coded strings, there's a dot to string. That often makes people tilt their head in confusion when they first see it, including me. As a side note, hard-coded strings are called string literals and are really string slices that are held in the program's binary or static memory. So, even though it doesn't look like it, it will have all the properties of a string slice. That's why we're able to call dot to string, as that's a function available to all string slice data types. 
To create a new string based on a string slice, we can use the string from method either on the string literal or on the string slice variable. Notice that the compiler can automatically determine we wanted a string type, not a string slice, based on how we initialized it. It didn't have to explicitly define it like we did with our previous variables. If it's obvious to the compiler what type of variable should be, the compiler can typically figure it out for itself. Anyways, that's going from a string slice to a string, but let's go the other way around. For that, we just use the ampersand in front of the string. This is a deref symbol, and Rust automatically knows how to perform that deref conversion from a string to a string slice. So, when I create a string slice from a string like this, it doesn't actually create a copy of the characters and shove them into a variable memory slot. It just points to the original memory of the string. We'll be going more in depth on that topic when we discuss borrowing. It's more efficient at runtime than creating copies and is one of the many things that helps Rust be lightning fast when it runs. Let's now talk about how to combine strings. This frustrates many programmers. You would think that something as simple as adding two strings or slices would be trivial. For example, let's add together two hard-coded string literals and see what happens. Unfortunately, we get a compile error, which is very confusing to most people, including myself. There are multiple ways to go about this. To add two string slices together, you can put them in an array and then call concat. The result of that will be a string, not a string slice, so it's actually bumping it to a different type when you add two string slices together. Another way is to use the format macro, which is similar to the print line except that it returns data instead of printing to the terminal. This too will result in a string, not a string slice. Weirdly, to combine a string and a string slice, you can just add them like so. Be aware that this only works if the string is first and not the string slice. If I reverse the order and put the string slice first, you'll get a compile error. That may feel odd, but it is a constraint when adding a string to a string slice. Until you understand borrowing in Rust, this isn't going to make much sense. But borrowing is a much more advanced topic that is beyond the scope of this video. When you're watching the borrowing video, try to keep this scenario in mind and perhaps think about why this behavior is the way it is. It's a good thinking exercise. Let's create a brand new string to play with with the new method. This just creates a blank string that can be mutated or modified. The compiler automatically knows it's a string type because of how we initialized it, so there's no need to put the colon and string to explicitly define it. If you have the mutable string, you can add to it by using the push str on the string variable itself. Or you can add hardcoded strings or string literals the same way. For cars, you need to use the push statement, not the push str. As a reminder, individual characters are surrounded by single quotes, not double. If I try to push it with double quotes, you'll get a compile error. Push is meant for individual characters with a single quote. Push str, or push string slice, is meant for the string slices or string literals. You might be tempted to think a car is a single character string. It's actually much more than that. It holds much more information. When I add a car, the string variable may hold that information in a surprising way, and we'll touch upon that shortly. If you need to add two strings together, that too has some quirks. The first string being added is fine as is, but each subsequent string will need an ampersand in front of it, which, as a reminder, is a cheap way of getting a string slice from a string. So what's really going on is it's just translating each additional string into a string slice so it can add. You can add more strings to it if you like, and in doing so, you just need to know that the first string does not have an ampersand, but the remainder do. This may be confusing for now, but we'll be going deeper into this topic when we discuss borrowing. What if you wanted a substring? 
For that case, we can use the bracket notation. You give it the starting point and the end point separated by two dots. The two dots can be read as up to but not including. Here it would read character zero up to but not including character two. If you wanted the slice to start at the beginning, you can just omit the first number. This is actually equivalent to when we had the zero there. Likewise, if you wanted to get the remainder of the string to the end, just omit the last number. This notation actually works on both the string and the string slice. Here I can use the example str or example string slice and it, and it still compiles fine. As a reminder, our example string slice contains the word howdy. You might think that this substring will return HOW because it seems you're getting characters 0, 1, and 2. The starting point is inclusive, but the end point is not. So what this is really saying is it starts from 0 and go up to, but not including, the second index. In mathematical notation, it's more like this with the round parentheses at the end instead of the square bracket. As an example, if I have 2 to 4, it would read character index 2, but not including character index 4. This may take some getting used to if you're coming from a different language. There's another notation that will include the last index, and that's if you put an equal sign after the two dots like this. That reads character index 2 up to and including character index 4. We'll be discussing this notation more in another video when we talk about vectors and arrays. Note, there is a danger when converting from a string to a string slice in this fashion. You can easily overshoot the indexes if you're not careful. Although this doesn't give a compile error, it will panic, meaning your program will crash. Be careful when you're using this notation to get substring slices. You might surmise that you can get any single character by just using the index, but this is not the case. Cars are much more than a single letter, and unfortunately this only confuses dealing with strings even more. What you can do is call the cars and get the nth character like so. As a side note, this cars function can be used to loop through each character in a string. In the arrays and vectors video, I'll discuss it further. Okay, what the nth car does is bring back what's known as an option. Since the nth character may or may not exist and can potentially cause a runtime error, this brings back a safe type that requires the programmer to handle the possibility of it not existing. It's safer than the substring slice notation because errors are handled at compile time and you don't have to worry about your program crashing or creating bad data. This method of getting a single character is the same on both a string and a string slice, which is nice. Let's go ahead and unpack that with the match statement like so. What this is saying is, if there is some character found, put it in a temporary placeholder called C, or whatever I decide to call it, so that I can do something with it. All I'm going to do is print it out to the terminal. If there is no character, for example, if we overshot and used an index larger than the string itself, then it goes to the none branch, and the curly braces like this means I just don't want to do anything. But you could if you wanted. Or there's a shorthand with what's called a if let. What this is saying is if the nth character exists, go ahead and enter the if statement. It's a completely safe shorthand way of dealing with the situation that would cause memory issues. Both the match statement and the if let are described in future videos in more depth. The difficulty of teaching Rust, or any language for that matter, is it's difficult to describe any topic without it treading on other topics, but hopefully this is not too confusing. If it is, perhaps come back to this video after we've touched upon match statements and if lets, and this may make more sense. Unfortunately, the topic of strings is where many programmers tune out and give up on Rust, which is a shame because they never see the real magic. I encourage you to stick with it. For an in-depth discussion on cars, strings, and string slices, I recommend the following URL. Once again, my name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley, and I look forward to seeing you next time.